next on Investigative Report. U.S. forces under orders by President Joe Biden have just completed a hasty retreat of the embassy personnel and contractors on a date that would match the anniversary of the September 11th attacks. The leadership of the Afghan capital Kabul was left in a lurch reminiscent of the fall of Saigon some 46 years earlier. Before 9-11, few if any Americans concentrated on a small Central Asian country some 7,000 plus miles from your shores. But now most consider the mission to bring peace to the region a complete failure. As U.S. forces tasked with the mission, were forced to defend themselves in a 20-year mountainous war against the Taliban. In this issue of Investigator Report, we weigh the cost of war, the long-term injuries to U.S. veterans, and the deaths in Kabul, the fall of Afghanistan. The United States launches a daring night raid against the home base of the 9-11 hijackers in Afghanistan. America would rally behind the 43rd president during the initial salvo of the war on terror. 20 years later, support for that war will be questioned by the vast majority of American citizens in a conflict that killed approximately 2,400 U.S. soldiers. A long and bloody war that left an additional 20,320 wounded. With a great percentage of these soldiers returning to their civilian lives, the amount of suicides had begun to rise. Each day in America, 20 veterans commit suicide. It would seem that the war on terror has caused a terrifying toll on the lives of those charged with defending the homeland. It would also appear that some of the lessons we learned during the Vietnam War have been lost prior to the conflict in Afghanistan. For example, it was well understood when we fully pulled out of Vietnam in 1975 that no one nation should enter a military conflict with the ending goal of nation building. In a form of deja vu, just as when we were on this same continent during the Vietnam conflict, we would close the war down by passing off the country into the hands of the very same people we defended it against. As a nation, we would relinquish Afghanistan to the Taliban through subsequent peace treaties that they would neither honor or respect. Borders clearly agreed upon in the negotiations that were trounced upon. The tragedy of Afghanistan in 2021 was that without real civilian leadership in the absence of the Afghan president's abandonment, there would remain a power vacuum that only a military force could hope to fill. The Taliban, who the U.S. initially rail controlled the country away from, knew it was their time to step forward and take charge of that vacuum. We should not have been surprised because we have seen this play out before. During the Vietnam War, the United States of America spent two decades trying to convert a then communist regime into a democracy. We entered Vietnam in 1965 only 12 short years after we declared a ceasefire in the country of Korea. The United States would also call a ceasefire in Vietnam in the year 1973, a full eight years after the conflict had started. This is why the Afghan war is referred to as America's longest war, because the Vietnam conflict, which was the longest war prior, lasted eight years and the Afghan war lasted 20. But if you count the fact that we remained in Vietnam until 1975, you would end up with the 10 year total. But what followed in both war zones is an exact replica in how not to exit a nation building conflict. In 1975, after the United States of America agreed to leave the country of Vietnam, the North Vietnamese army made its way south to the capital Saigon. The Northern soldiers were found little resistance after the Americans exodus and quickly took over the capital, thus ending the Vietnam War and emerging North and South Vietnamese into one rule under communism. The new ruling authority dismissed the former president of South Vietnam and began to re-educate the citizens of the South under a Ho Chi Minh doctrine of communism. 
Many others were executed, especially those who were once loyal to the American government. South Vietnamese citizens who had anticipated the North's takeover days in advance made a mad dash to the airport and the U.S. Embassy in order to leave the country, which is what you see now in Afghanistan. They are exactly the same. There's a parallel there. In a sense, reminiscent of the current exodus of Afghanistan airport on April the 30th in 1975, the remaining American citizens still in Vietnam at the direction of President Nixon were airlifted out of that country. All this hastily took place as Saigon failed to communist forces, trapping interpreters, contractors, and sympathizers who pled with the U.S. forces to take them back to the America. In that war, we paid a heavy toll with the U.S. soldiers' lives. In total, during the entire Vietnamese conflict, we lost 58,220 soldiers to enemy fire. During the entire Afghanistan war, we lost much less, that being 2,372 lives. But before we pat ourselves on the back with that reduced number of deaths, you should first understand that we are losing more soldiers and veterans to suicide over the last 10 years than we have lost in the actual combat in the war on Vietnam. In fact, we lose about four times as many ex-soldiers to suicide each year than we did in the entire Afghanistan war over the last 20. In America, approximately 8,030 active and former soldiers take their own lives annually. More former soldiers took their life last year than actually died in combat over the same time period. During the Vietnam War, 304,000 soldiers were wounded out of the total of 2.7 million that served in that theater over the eight-year time period. In the Afghanistan conflict, 20,320 soldiers were wounded out of the entire 800,000 that served there. This means that one soldier in 40 had the possibility of being wounded in Afghanistan in action, while in Vietnam, that number was about one in nine. The Afghanistan war took 20 years to fight, while it only took 10 days for the capital Kabul to fold under the Taliban's advance. In comparison, the Vietnam war took eight years, but an additional two years before the capital Saigon ultimately capitulated to the north. Since the beginning of the war on terror, which began with the U.S. and British Special Forces on October 7, 2001, the United States has not fought alone. This conflict was the first since the birth of NATO. The first since the birth of NATO to get involved in an abroad offense. NATO, known for the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, invoked its charter of collective defense for the first time in history. Collective defense means that an attack against one ally is considered as an attack against all allies. Now, these two wars were proven similar in all ways to include that the participants of its soldiers. Similar to the 1960s drafted you for the war in Southeast Asia, Afghanistan was a conflict in which a little boy watching a conflict on TV with his friend at an age of five years could actually end up fighting on its front lines alongside that friend as an adult. So beyond the human toll of any war, beyond the fact that our allies have faced injuries and deaths we as a country end up holding the bag for a repeated failed experiment. The war in Vietnam cost the American taxpayer a grand total of $168 billion or $1 trillion in today's money. Now this includes $111 billion in military operations and $2.5 billion in aid to South Vietnam. 26 years later, by the time we get to the Afghanistan war, we become more adept at spending money on war but not any better at nation building. The Afghanistan war cost $2 trillion, double what it spent in Vietnam over the same time period and with less troops and even less equipment. When it comes to the full cost of nation building, we rounded out to the nearest billion. Since 2001, Washington has spent more on nation building in Afghanistan than any other country ever, allocating $100 billion for reconstruction aid programs and the Afghan security forces. Adjusted for inflation, that is more than the United States spent in Western Europe with the Marshall Plan after World War II. But let us fast forward in history to the last presidency, 
where President Donald Trump authorized Pentagon to make combat decisions in Afghanistan. And on April 13th, 2017, the United States dropped its most powerful non-nuclear bomb called the mother of all bombs. They did this on the top of a remote ISIS cave complex. In August of that same year, President Donald Trump delivered a speech to American troops vowing, we will fight to win in Afghanistan. The Taliban continued to escalate its terrorist attacks and the United States entered peace talks with the group in February of 2019. But what did it yield us? What did we get from that? Now, ultimately a deal was reached that included the US and NATO allies pledging a total withdrawal within 14 months time frame if the Taliban had vowed to not harbor terrorist groups. You're watching MNN, the men's channel. By September, the then President Donald Trump called off the talks after a Taliban attack that left a U.S. soldier and 11 others dead. The president said then that if they cannot agree to a ceasefire during these very important peace talks and would even kill 12 innocent people, then they probably don't have the power to negotiate a meaningful agreement anyway. Yet and still, the United States and Taliban signed a peace agreement on February 29th of 2020. Now, although Taliban attacks against Afghanistan forces continued, as did American airstrikes, in September 2020, members of the Afghan government met with the Taliban to resume peace talks. And in November, Trump announced that he planned to reduce U.S. troops in Afghanistan to 2,500 by January 15th of the year 2021. The fourth president in power during the war, President Joe Biden, in April of 2021, set the symbolic deadline of September 11, 2021, the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks, as a date of full U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, with the final withdrawal effort beginning in the month of May. Now, we begin this nation-building adventure with the unfortunate deaths of 2,700 innocent people in the north and south towers of the World Trade Center, New York City. We end in Kabul, where we first started the takeover of Afghanistan at a cost of two trillion U.S. dollars. Now, two trillion dollars that could have been used for education of U.S. students as opposed to forced education in a country that refuses to educate their own children. Instead of building roads, bridges, schools and airports in a foreign country, we could have easily done that here. If you wanted to give a stimulus check to every man, woman, and child in the United States that would round off to $5,500 each of that $2 trillion we wasted in Afghanistan. That means instead of the government piecemealing with long debates and short checks of $1,000 or less, everyone hypothetically would be financially sound. Why? With $5,500 per person, that means that a family of five would have one check to the tune of $27,000 $500 in one lump sum. For Investigative Report, this is Charles Rivers. We thank you for watching.